Thank you, Lawrence. I'm really pleased that you've all come, that you're interested in the subject, and hopefully you will get a, a lot out of it. You've all had your handouts. The handouts are things you could refer to here, and then, of course, when you're back uh, in your colleges and schools. Uh, the material there uh, will reflect the, the, the lecture and cover things that I can't go over in great detail in the 50 minutes I have. I'm also looking forward uh, to answering the questions uh, that some of you have, have proposed. I would like to uh, thank uh, my colleagues at uh, the All Medic Butler Education Trust for their support and crucially to thank three colleagues from the All Medic Butler Race Relations Resource Center. Sam, who you've already met, Julie Devenold, who you've probably seen and welcomed you, and Emma Britton, who has the power to control the, um, the, the PowerPoint. Their commitment and the imagination and the, the effort that they've put into this event has just been uh, spectacular, and I'm very grateful for the work that they've done. Now, what I'd like to do today is to take you partly on a roller coaster ride, uh, because as some, the two of your teachers were my students many years ago for, for, for their sins, uh, and Emma was one of my students. They'll know that, that I, I find it very difficult to, to take a narrow approach to a specific topic, because I'm constantly trying to say, but you have to know the context. You have to know the, the context, because if you don't know the context, you wind up with a very narrow interpretation. So I'm going to try to provide the context as well as to look in detail at the key points of the civil rights movement and then try to look at what has happened since then and try to conclude about where we, where we wound up. And to do this, I begin with um, a couple of quotes which I think inform the way I, I, I approach the subject. And the first, and I think I'm happy I could be in Britain and I can quote Karl Marx rather than having to make believe it was Harpo who said it, um, that human, human beings make their own history but not under terms and conditions of their own choosing. And that means that we don't focus only on the people at the top. And we don't only focus on the people or the movements that succeed, as if somehow or other the movements that didn't succeed never existed. We, we'll see for the civil rights struggle that many of the tactics that were adopted successfully in the 1960s had actually originated in earlier in American history, but the context, the conditions were not yet ripe. So it wasn't the lack of commitment, it wasn't the lack of courage, it was the context was not right. And secondly, I want to quote from Frederick Douglass, who was uh, an ex-slave and a leader of the abolitionist movement in America, who said that find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have the exact measure of the injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And I think these are crucial points to understand that people resist people's struggle when they can, and how they succeed or not will be identified by looking at these contexts. Now to understand this, it seems to me we have to understand that the United States as a society, as a history, coming out of the British North American colonies was based on a particular form of slavery. Slavery has existed throughout human history, but what was crucial about this new form of race-based slavery was that it created two racial groups, because race is not a scientific concept, racial is a social construction. So it created black people who were the fit subjects for enslavement, and it constructed white races as the people who were not to, not to be enslaved and therefore racially distinct who would be superior to black people. As one historian said, even if every, in analyzing this, even if every black wasn't a slave, as long as every slave was a black, then we had constructed such a system. This construction of two races has been central to the attempt to solve another fundamental problem in our society, and I thought of interest to people who are studying political science as well as history. And that is, when you have a liberal democracy, the question is, if you extend democratic rights, the vote eventually, to the majority, and they're the propertyless majority, how can the property holding minority keep power? How would they stop the propertyless 
minor, majority from ganging up. And the crucial way this is done, historically and at the present time, is through divide and rule. It's creating divisions among the majority. It's what I call the politics of at leastness. At least I'm white. At least I'm a male. At least I'm heterosexual. At least I'm employed. And that gives me status above someone who is black, someone who is a female, someone who is unemployed, someone who is gay. And as long as those are the key parts of our identity, then we will be divided. And racism has been a central part of the entire history of the United States as the vehicle to keep people divided. Now, the problem facing the, the majority, historically in the present time, was posed after the Civil War by Thaddeus Stevens, a radical Republican congressman who asked whether it was possible to have political democracy if a, if a tiny minority controlled most of the land, because at that point he was looking at the Confederacy in the South. Nowadays, we'd say, how could you have political democracy if a tiny minority control most of the wealth of the society? So hopefully what I'm talking about is not just of historical interest or, or arcane archaeological interest, or not even just about the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, but it has relevance to the changes that have taken place in society since then. Now, this, after the Civil War, these problems were resolved at the expense of the ex-slaves and at the expense of the poor whites. And that is, after the Civil War, what the ex-slaves needed and wanted was land. That would enable them to make their freedom real. They were agrarians, they worked on the land, and, and they had been promised 40 acres and a mule. That was denied them because it was not in the interest of people with power, the southern landowners or northern industrialists, for that land system, the plantation system, to be broken apart. So instead what was constructed was a system which, in which the big landowners maintained the sort of reestablished plantation system. I hope this is making some sense because what that meant was that poor blacks and poor whites were then denied the vote, denied economic freedom, denied opportunity for social mobility. But in order to make sure that the poor whites and poor blacks were divided, a system of political legal control was established. And we call that de jure segregation. Um, if you, we have a glossary that's been produced for you. If you don't know the term, de jure means legal. So it was a system of legal segregation which shaped every part of black people's lives. And indeed, this was 50 years it received the, the imprimatur of the Supreme Court of the United States. In 1896, the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, established but separate but equal, was a law of the land. Now this was 50 years before in South Africa, apartheid became the dominant legal system of that country. So some of you might have read about apartheid and Nelson Mandela and so on. Well, the United States had that system 50 years before South Africa did. Now what that did was create not just a system which kept African Americans down, supported by terrorism, violence, lynching, but it was a way of controlling the poor whites. Because the poor whites were given racial superiority rather than economic rights, rather than the vote, rather than the right to feed their children, but at least they were white. So if they walked down the street and they confronted an African-American man walking, the African-American man had to, go, had to go in the gutter. And if they stopped to talk, the African man had to take his cap off. And the African man would, would be deferential to you. And you could say, how is Beulah? And Beulah, not Mrs. Smith, but you could call his wife by, by, his first, by her first name, but he had to refer to your wife as, how is Mrs. Jones? So the entire system was predicated on this legal system which was always backed up by terror and which separated white and black, which therefore maintained the, the power of the system. Now, there was, of course, black resistance to this system, which met with lynchings, beatings, 
economic terrorism, driving people out. And how do people re re respond to this? Well, there were various responses. The first, one of the, the main national leaders of, of the leaders appointed by the white society was Booker T. Washington, who in the 1890s pr promised the white elite a docile, loyal workforce who would be more loyal to the South than the immigrant workers who were being imported to work in northern industry. And that told the blacks that they had to be well behaved and eventually they will receive justice. This was opposed by the Niagara movement created by, Booker, by W. E. B. Du Bois in 1905 and later, 1909, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, which is still in existence. And the NAACP was formed because of increasing levels of lynchings throughout the South and by a race riot in Springfield, Illinois, which was the home of Abraham Lincoln, where he was buried. And the, the, so they had this, this, this organization created to challenge the Bookerist assumptions.